Central rivals go head-to-head -head this weekend when the Pirates face the Cubs at Wrigley. It's swing and a miss. He stuck him out. The pregame at 3 Eastern, first pitch at 4, Saturday on ESPN Radio and the new ESPN app. Coming up on the Best of the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast, Matt Jones from Kentucky Sports Radio is in studio. Plus, Casey Joyner tells us why Alabama won't win the SEC, and the great Maria Taylor gives me a lesson in swag. It's the Best of the Feinbaum Show podcast, and it starts right now. This is the Best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Matt Jones with us from uh, Kentucky Sports Radio. Matt, we were talking during uh, the break about uh, you're from Eastern Kentucky. You, you had I, I was intrigued. Uh, I was on. I've been on your show a couple of times, and every time I'm on, it's like I don't know what's happening on on, on the on Twitter, on the internet, uh, just to, in, just in terms of conversation. Talk a little bit about your background and and how you really have become in many ways the voice of Kentucky. Well, I, I grew up uh, in the mountains, and then I went to a little school in Lexington called Transylvania, went to law school at Duke, which a lot of people in Kentucky get very angry at the notion that I that I well, went Well, you couldn't to. get in Kentucky? I could not get in, <laughs> and so they let me in, in at Duke. And then I started a blog there called Kentucky Sports Radio. I'm a big example of when you don't know if you can do something, just act like you've done it, right. and hopefully it'll happen. So I wanted a radio show, so I called it Kentucky Sports Radio and then ended up getting one. But you're right, we have a strong sort of Twitter following. Kentucky Sports Illustrated did a story that said Kentucky fans are on Twitter more than any other fan base in the country. Now, I don't know how they quantified that, but they said that they were. And I think you see it when you come on. When, when people come on, they just go. And when media say, says something that Kentucky fans don't like, they come after them. And that's kind of what Twitter has become. It's sort of the sounding board in, in Kentucky. And you aren't shy. Uh, no. And in terms of some of the more infamous scraps uh, that you've gotten into, uh, how would you? Uh... Well, I've had a few. You know, there are people who cover uh, who cover sports that just annoy me for a variety of reasons. <laughs> I like And that. I'm a big believer that radio is radio especially, but TV too. People like if they know you. Like they, and so they like, I don't think they care. They want to know who you like and dislike. So there are some people that I think are sort of not as talented as they believe they are. Mm -hmm. And there are some people I think are sort of attached at the hip to certain coaches. And I like to call them out and say, you know what? I don't think, I think this guy's overrated at 40. I mean, you and, got, and you know, that you, you, try, you try to do that and make sure that they're known. And I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I mean, you not only have called other writers out, but I mean, you, you've gotten, you, 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 maybe it's your legal background. Maybe it's just being an investigative reporter. But I mean, you've exposed them for things that they. I mean, li, I mean, public things. You haven't like gone into their waste yeah. waste can looking for. Uh, I'm a big believer. Like journalists are the most thin-skinned people in the United States. Would you agree with that? I would. I would. I mean, so they believe they can say something about a coach, and it should be fine. But you can't say anything back about them. So over the years, Cal Perry's, of course, a big target. And so I look at Cal Perry's critics and say, well, what have you done? Where in your background have you maybe had some ethical missteps? <laughs> and I like to expose that. And it makes them very mad. They get very angry at you. You're not the most popular guy in the press room. But I'm all right with that. I mean, I, you know, there are friends. You know this. There are friends and then there are media friends. And, like, media friends aren't, for the most part, real friends. So I don't, I don't care that it hasn't made me the most popular guy. What it has done is made fans feel like you're taking up for them, and I, and I don't mind that. And I know in your career you had some of those moments as well. Well, so. I'll tell you one quick story. I was, I was working for a newspaper, and uh, a big story involved me in the newspaper, and I think it was an AP reporter called me, and I gave him a comment, and my editor like called me in started cursing. He said, why did you talk to that guy? I said, well, because that's what we do. I mean, we're always trying to get people to talk to us, but – uh, I, I think it, it and, you, and there aren't really any newspapers left in the world, so there's no reason to, to mention Which that. Which also makes them mad. I mean, they, <laughs> because most media think that's what it should all be. Like, they don't like radio, TV. They think newspapers. That's what it is. But newspapers, I mean, my grandparents read newspapers, sure. and I use them to, like, put on the plates when we go somewhere. But, I mean, that's, it's not what it once was. I subscribe just so my neighbors will think I'm smart. <laughs> Get the coupons on yeah, Sunday. Right. I, I hate to say that. Look, there's a lot of people that do really good work on newspapers, but the hard print newspaper is a thing of the past. I mean, people that are reading newspapers are going to do it online. They're reading it on their phones. And at that point, really, how different are they than websites? So I, I tend to call that out, and it doesn't make me the most popular. And then, you know, Cal Perry, the connection with Cal also is part of it. You know, Cal is the most... 
controversial figure in college basketball, certainly, maybe college athletics. And so being a, a Cal Perry supporter, I think it rubs people the wrong way, too. What's he like? He, I think he's a, a lot different than people think. Well, first of all, off, I will say this. When you see him on press conferences, that's what he's like in private. Really? Like, he's, he talks the same way. Like, he's always moving around and he's always – but I think people don't realize how kind he is. He gets what it means to be the Kentucky coach. I always contrast, like, him and Rick Pitino. So when Rick Pitino was at Kentucky, he was beloved. But he very much was like, okay, will you please keep the people over there? <laughs> like, please don't, please don't touch me. Can you, can you give me some space? This is a nice suit. Cal is amongst them. Cal's hugging people. He's kissing babies. He's a politician. He could run for Senate in Kentucky, and he's the guy who could beat Mitch McConnell or Rand Paul if he wanted Rand to. Paul, I've heard, of it. I've heard his name lately. He comes around a little bit. So I, I think that he doesn't get credit for that. But he's also a guy who he is obsessed with his job. He, like, he doesn't know how to rest. You know, you and I talked earlier about another coach that when he won wasn't necessarily completely happy. I remember when Cal won the national championship, I wanted to say to him, smile. Be happy because he just he's so intense and work is such a huge part of his life that it becomes like all obsessing to, for him, I think, at some time. No, I told this story. I, I saw it was a week after Nick Saban won his first national championship at Alabama. I was I happened to be in Houston uh, for the uh, Bryant Award winner for the uh, coach of the year. And I saw him at the right beforehand. I said, hey, congratulations, coach. He goes, yeah, but I said, yeah, but what? He said, yeah, you win. You just because you win, that just means you have a whole new set of problems. I'm like, oh, never mind. I mean, yeah. what's the point? I mean, yeah, but, that, but that's true. I mean, I remember when when Cal won that title in 2012. I watched him in his post game press conference, and I thought to myself, smile, man. I mean, be be happy. We well, knew he had to do it again. Yeah, he did, he looked exhausted, and I think that's why this one hurt everybody a little bit as yeah. they thought, okay, the second one, especially if they can go 40-0 and and get in history, it will really be one everybody can enjoy, and then, of course, they, they lost. So It, it is. Uh, I mean, but that's, but that's just the nature of, of that type of personality. Uh, and Never satisfied? Well, because you know that if you, if you stop to take a deep breath, then uh, somebody else is, is, go, is going to catch you. In terms of Cal dealing with it, though, I mean, that was a devastating loss. It was devastating, also because they should have won. They're up four with four minutes to go, and they get three straight shot clock violations. I mean, that, that, that stinks. And the other thing is it's always the worst when you're the best team. When you're the best team, I think losses hurt more. You know, Kentucky in 92 lost on the Leitner shot. But that team really didn't have any business being in that game. I mean, that Duke, Duke team was good. That Duke team's one of the best teams of all time. And that Kentucky team was four guys that grew up where I grew up in yeah. eastern Kentucky. This is different. I mean, this was history. It's right there. It's You're on the grass. And they would have beaten Duke. You cannot tell me they would not have beaten Duke. They were better than Duke. Wisconsin was just a tougher matchup, and I think it was so close. Fans, I predict in 25 years, fans will actually, that will hurt more than the Duke one in some ways because the, people look back and go, that should have been our ninth title. Yeah, I think the Duke one, uh, and again, my good friend uh, Gene Wojciechowski helped celebrate it mm-hmm. it's, you know, because of the, the, it was such an iconic moment. But this was a bigger game. This was the national semifinal. This wasn't a regional final. And it was a hyped game. I mean, think about the hype that would have been for Kentucky Duke in the finals. Yeah. That would have been one of the most hyped games of all time. Yeah. And, you know, you get there, and the, the way the season played out, where they had 38 games that all felt like they were in the tournament. Because when you want to go undefeated, that road game at LSU is not just a road game at LSU. That's a road game where they say, this is to stay undefeated. Right. And so it felt like one long, extended NCAA tournament run. So what's John Calipari doing right now? Is he in a, is he in a he locked room? He is recruiting, room? I think. Oh, okay. I mean, they, they, first of all, they may not have the class they normally have. Now, they got the number one player in America coming next year, Scal uh, Labissiere, but they had like four guys. Four of the top seven or eight guys haven't decided yet, and I'm not sure Kentucky's going to get any of them. They're on all four of them, but they might not get any of them. So he's recruiting. He's having to really press to, to finish so that the team will be at the level he wants it to be next year. Because they had seven guys go to the NBA, which also hurts yeah, you. Yeah, I, I remember that press conference last What did you think of that, by the way? Um, I thought it was – Pretty upbeat, all things considered. I did too. And you got to like the showmanship when he says seven guys all stand up if they're going to the draft, and then they all they all stand up. But he's going to get four or five of those will go in the first round. Probably all seven will get drafted. And but that also makes it hurt more for Kentucky fans because they say it's seven guys, 
and they, and they were so close to uh, getting it. To me, it seemed like it would hurt more as well because th there were so many critics, uh, the Dan Shaughnessy's of the world. Who I mean, were you brought out. on here, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Um, and I, I, I thought of that last night. I was, I'm watching CNN, and we had, we had Dan Shaughnessy on here talking about Calipari. Last night he's on CNN talking about Aaron Hernandez. Am I going, what's wrong with this picture? But see, guys like that, see, Dan Shaughnessy is a perfect example of what I'm talking about with journalists. Because that dude holds a grudge at its core. The mm -hmm. reason he doesn't like Cal is because 20 some years ago, Cal did not invite a Boston Globe reporter into his home for an NCAA selection show. And he has held a 20 year old grudge about that. I mean, Dan, maybe get a haircut and worry less about what's happening with, with, with Cal and with this. It's unbelievable to me. It's 20 years and he still is firing at him because of that. I just, I don't get it. If coaches did that with media members, they'd get blasted for But it. because he had so many critics, I mean, to me, it would seem like that it made it hurt more because Cal could have oh, sat he, up there and said, told, I mean, he wouldn't have done it, but everyone shut up. Cal I, I, was sort of set for what I said was like his going down a blaze of glory press conference, to sit up there 40-0. And say, you folks didn't think we could do it like this. We did it. We went undefeated. Hey, Bobby Knight, you're the last guy to go undefeated. You hate me, and now I've taken it. He was set up for that moment that in everybody's career you wish you have, where all your critics kind of get silenced, and then it didn't happen. And Kentucky fans were ready for him to have that moment, too. See, you're making me depressed just thinking about it as the, with the Kentucky background I have. But, I mean, it really was uh, kind of a lost opportunity. Matt Jones with us. I'm going to take a break. I want to come back and talk a little bit more about the culture and trying to uh, be the, the face and voice of a program in, in today's media. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. So Matt, we were chatting during our uh, break there about the disconnect between the media and fans and everyone else. Talk a little bit about I think, that. now, there, there are exceptions to this. Like, guys like you or people they see on TV, like, say, Herb Street. People really like Herb Street because they feel like they know him, you know. But I don't think people realize how much they don't like most mainstream media members, especially if you're in a college town. A lot of people think that the way to do it is to antagonize the coach, and I don't think that fans really like that very much. The media is not beloved, um, but I don't know that, that, that media members get that. Now, everybody's doing a better job. Let me say this. I think for a long time the media didn't give fans what they want. I think they're doing better about it because Twitter and stuff allows them to tell them what they want. But for a long time I would read the, our local newspaper in Lexington, and they would write about all these things that I thought, Kentucky fans don't care about that. And, but people are getting better because they can't help it. The business requires them to. But, you know, back to the personalities, and, you know, there are some very thin-skinned coaches oh. who, who say, uh, I'll never get out, a very famous coach would, would always say that uh, he he didn't listen, didn't read, and I was at his house one day, and there was a newspaper sitting right there. <laughs> I don't, first of all, I don't believe any of them that say that. Really? I mean, I don't, I don't. They may not read on a daily basis, but they hear, somebody tells sure. them something. Now, I think there are some coaches that sort of just let it roll off their their back but not but i think most of them get it i mean spurrier is the one i always follow what's the guy in south carolina that he seems oh like? he tried to get some guy fired though, yeah he tried to get a guy fired i mean that's and by the way he tried to do that in florida too this is the the beloved steve spurrier uh i came remember is it, i think it was, is it ron morris something like that yeah that's amazing to me that he, that he wanted to do that but it's because it does have an influence now all those writers though have less influence than they used to because it used to be if that was the only time you could read anything about South Carolina. But now they can do it. That's what I want to ask you, uh, because you are of a, you're 32 years old. You're of a totally different era uh, than what I grew up in, where, where newspapers were the king until they started going out of business on a, on a regular basis. What makes sports fans tick today? Social media. I, I do think, surprisingly, I think sports talk radio has survived in a way that I, I wouldn't necessarily have thought five or six years but ago. But not what it was. It's not what it was, but I think in some places it still is. I mean, like, some, like, like Kentucky. Like Kentucky. <laughs> but like Mike Francesa in New York, right. is still there are places it's still big. I think social media is where it's at for young people. I mean, what people do on social media, they figure out who they're going to follow. And their news for the day comes from that. Right. It's just whatever comes up on their screen. And if it doesn't come up on their screen, it did not happen. In, in a lot so of you, you have what I think is one of the most incredibly loyal 
followers because whenever I've mentioned your name, whenever I've been on your show, I mean, the next thing I know, I'm, it's like dealing with, with a, a whole different sub world. I didn't say subculture. Um, <laughs> you, almost did. you wanted to. I came close. Yeah. But how do you interact uh, outside of your radio show every day with your social media? Well, first of all, I read the stuff they do on the air, which you guys do a great job of in here. You put the tweets yeah. on the bottom of the screen. People like to see their names. And you should see the tweets we're getting right now that we're, we can't put on the bottom of the screen about you. <laughs> Are they bad? Uh, hello to whoever out there. That's uh, Louisville fans. Nice to see you. But the, the, the people like to see their name on TV, okay. right? People also like to see, like, for you to say, talk about them on the air. So okay. if you just say their Twitter handle, I think people like that. But more importantly, I think they just want to feel like they contribute to the show. So hey, Paul, address this issue. I want to talk about. So it. you mention their name and then you answer mention the their name. If you say Rick says to me, "Hey, Paul, what do you think Gus Malzahn's recruiting class is like?" They just like they go tell everybody, hey, put Paul read my thing, and that really helps them be involved, and that's what I want to do. I feel like the audience is just an extension of what I do. That's why you've been so successful. I mean, not to just kiss your butt, but that's why people like you because they feel like you're one of them rather than being up on high just giving your opinion. But are you then placating the fan base, which is yes. understandable. You are. Of course, you are. yes. Okay. I mean, again, media act like they're better than the fans. Okay. Why are they? You're not better than fans. This is not rocket science, okay. okay? This is sports. This is sports, college sports. And sometimes media members act like we're curing cancer. We're talking <laughs> about sports. I, I, everybody played sports growing up. This is not some, you know, hardcore mathematics. So, yeah, their opinions are just as valid. Now, sometimes the opinions are stupid and you can make fun of them, but they're just but as you, valid. But you want Kentucky to win. I do, yes. But I don't think there's anything wrong with that if you acknowledge your bias. Okay. I mean, take Bill Simmons. Okay. Is there a more important part of ESPN than Bill Simmons? I mean, he may be the most important media member at ESPN. He says, I want the Red Sox to win. I want the Celtics to win. I want the Bruins to win. Patriots. I say, I'd like Kentucky to win. That's okay. Your friends, the, what's worse are the reporters who want somebody to win or lose and then don't tell you. Right. Right? So well, they newspaper write, reporters are, and, and all reporters are supposed to be objective nobody's objective <laughs> nobody's objective come on nobody right, do you really do you believe anybody's really objective no no nobody's think, no. objective so i just acknowledge my lack of ob objectivity so then people can say he's good bad or whatever i want to see some of these tweets people are saying that well, no we will we'll, we'll get them right. but 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 i agree with you on that i mean and, and i think newspaper reporters are the worst because they try to hide behind but in today's environment uh there are there are there aren't any there's no such thing as a newspaper reporter. They're they're writing for a website and they're filming little videos yeah. and they're doing oh, they're all great, kinds of things. Like, yeah, and you have to. They've had to adapt uh, to that. But you've met coaches in your in your days, right? And you've had coaches. Who's your favorite coach you've met? Can you say that? I'm objective. I don't have any person. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll tell you that my least favorite coach. Please. My least favorite coach is Tom Crean. Tom Crean. I think Tom Crean is Dwight Schrute from The Office. <laughs> All right, I think he is completely unlikable. He parts his hair down the middle just like Dwight Schrute, and he just seems like the kind of guy who would tell on you in class. Okay. Right? Top five on uh, dislike people. Dislike, by dislike coaches? Yeah. Tom Crean, by far number okay. one. Okay. Kevin Stallings. <laughs> Kevin Stallings. Would be number two. Again, I feel like he whines. Right, like I feel like I mean, you unloaded on him that day. We had well, you he on. deserved it. He's okay. also a character from the office. He's Kevin from the office. Okay. The two of them number, are, are number the three. A Patino, but Patino. that's but part of that is rivalry yeah. and and sort of uh, and sort of jealousy. Number four, I, probably uh, Bayheim, because I always feel like Bayheim's the kind of guy who'd be nice to your face. And then when he walks away from you, is like stabbing you with a, yeah. a voodoo doll or mm -hmm. something like that. And then number five, I don't know. That, that's a tougher one. I don't. I can't think of another basketball one right off the top of my head. I never liked Charlie Weiss. <laughs> I just kind of felt like nobody got paid more to do less than Charlie Weiss did over his career. So those, so, are, those are four football. But Tom Crean, by the way, way ahead of everybody. Four basketball, one full one football. Not that Charlie Weiss really counts as anything. In terms of uh, football. Football. Yes, in terms of not liking yeah, guys people in football. that you really don't like. Uh, I didn't like Urban Meyer at Florida because I kind of always felt like the act was sort of fake, although I, I don't mind him so much at Ohio State. I feel like maybe he's acknowledged kind of who he is okay. maybe a little bit more uh, than before. What do, you, what do you think of Nick Saban? I like Nick Saban. Oh, okay. I like Nick Saban because huh. I, I almost think he's like, 
He's almost like a robot. You can, stick, her, you can stick around for the next segment. <laughs> exactly. I think he's almost like a robot. He reminds me a lot of Cal. Yeah, there, there are some similarities. They're very similar. I like him. I also like greatness. I mean, I root for greatness. But who in the SEC don't you like? Who in the SEC don't I like? Football-wise. Well, Football-wise. Well, I, I, I hate Tennessee. So whoever is on, <laughs> whoever has anything to do with Tennessee is going to be. You don't like Butch Jones? Well, he seems like a fun. I mean, look, Butch Jones. You don't like him. Come on. When he puts on the color orange, I don't like okay. because I agree that's the worst color orange in the in the history okay. of mankind. So I'm not a huge fan. I don't know uh, the rest of the guys. They're sort of I think it's almost faceless in some ways. Do you, do you even know who the Kentucky football coach is? Of course, Mark Stoops. Now okay. I'm a big Stoops guy. <laughs> I just want to make sure. I'll tell you. There's one I don't like. I'm not a huge fan of his brother. No, because he keeps because he's another guy. What's what he whines? Always whining about the SEC, mm -hmm. and he's taking a lot of recruits from his little brother. Like they're about he to. Yeah. He's he's had three or four guys. Mark's been about to sign that Bob's taken. Wow, is that too much? Do you no, have any other no. Arrows? I'm, just, I'm just I'm just we're just planning out the rest of the summer shows based on what you're saying here. Well, I just my thing is I like guys with personality, and I like guys that don't whine. So if you have personality, Bruce Pearl, love Bruce Pearl. Okay. Love Bruce Pearl. Loved him at Tennessee. Probably the only coach at Tennessee I ever liked because I felt like he was real. I felt like he was kind of, you know, he painted his chest and all that. I just found that really enjoyable. So I, I, I root for him at Auburn. With the league needs other basketball schools. To so in the it. SEC, uh, you obviously like Stoops. You like Saban. Spurrier's somewhat of a Love liar. Spurrier. You like Spurrier. Love Spurrier, especially old school Spurrier, okay. the one that would talk trash. You know, he beat Kentucky one time, seventy to seven mm -hmm. at Florida. And they asked him how Mummy was at Kentucky. Right. And they asked him, you know, why did you keep running up the score at the end? And he said, well, look, they kept their starters in to pad their stats. And he said, our stats were suffering. I love that. I mean, most people would not do that. Spurrier keeps the gas on. I like it. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Ron is up next in Kentucky. Ron, thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, Paul. Hi there. Uh, I enjoyed your discussion with uh, Matt Jones. And uh, I just wanted to mention, I've, I've listened to his after-game and pre-game comments on U.K. basketball for several years. And one of the things that really uh, endears, I think, the Kentucky fan base to, to Matt Jones is that he never takes himself too seriously. Uh, he takes sports announcing seriously, obviously, because that's his profession. But he has an excellent sense of humor. Very seldom does he ever get into people's faces very much, and yet can be pretty, uh, I think, straightforward in terms of his positions on moderately sensitive issues from time to time, and uh, he just carries an immense level of popularity here in Kentucky. Well, let me say this, Ron. Uh, I think to, to be good at this, you have to have a sense of humor, and I... I think those who fail, and even even though even some are very successful, but still fail in many ways, is when they when they when they get when they let things get to them personally, and then they personally uh, respond. I mean, I do a lot of things on the show uh, in in humor or sometimes in anger, but you can't take it too seriously in terms of when people criticize you. If you can't be criticized, then you shouldn't do it. Uh, too many of, of my brethren take everything personally. Matt, to me, is very confident, has a great sense of humor. He's not afraid to dish it out, and uh, that makes him entertaining. Well, it, it certainly does, and he has a very loyal. I know he does. I mean, I, I am I, I am really struck by his popularity in Kentucky, and uh, I'm very impressed with what he's done for being so young. Yeah, and just his his attitude and his style that just kind of endears him, I think, to the fan base. And having a legal background with a, a, a law degree makes it interesting. You know, it just doesn't quite balance as normally as you would think it would balance in a situation like that. But uh, he certainly is very successful. And uh, I've always enjoyed your commentary uh, Paul, you do a wonderful job hosting that Joe uh, job, and uh, you remind me in some ways of the great Kay Wood Ledford here in Kentucky, who was uh, as popular of uh, a radio broadcaster of U.K. basketball games as we've ever had in the history of this state. Ron, I, uh, first of all, thank you for that. Uh, I, I had the great pleasure of meeting uh, Kay Wood and listening to him many, many times. I, I wouldn't ever put myself... 
uh, on that uh, plateau, but uh, I deeply appreciate your comments, and uh, I think Kaywood Lefford is perhaps the, the finest play-by-play -play announcer that college sports has ever had. I think you're probably right. He was from the Deep Mountains near Harlan, Kentucky, and uh, he and his wife grew miniature donkeys there on, on a little place on the farm, uh, just a very small place in coal country in Harlan, uh, Harlan near Harlan, Kentucky. But uh, he was just a marvelous, marvelous sports counselor, and uh, we had him as an annual meeting banquet speaker several years ago. And uh, he loved to smoke cigarettes, doggone it, and that, that killed him eventually. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, uh, and I, I was a huge fan. Thank you so much for the call. Let's check in with Jerome in Birmingham. What's up, Jerome? What's going on, Paul? I okay. tell you, Paul, I like old Matt. You know what? Matt just speak his mind. You know what? You know what, Paul? He just tell you like it is and just bottom line, fine, Paul. I tell you what, Sports Talk Radio is dead, Paul. You know that? I tell you, it's been dead for a long time. You got the appetizer in the morning. You got the dessert in the afternoon, Paul. But everybody in the nation waits on the fine farm show, Paul. Fine. You got that? Everybody in the nation, just like they wait on the tide. And for this clown to get on here, Paul, this Paul is the best article he done wrote in his career. You hear me? The Alabama win an SEC championship and a national championship before he win a writer's award, Paul. You hear me? A <laughs> college award. Anything, Pine Bone. I tell you another thing, Pine Bone. Take this out. Bottom line is, Pine Bone, tell these clowns and the rest of the nation, we want a rematch with Ohio State, Paul. That's all Alabama worry about. Nobody else in the nation is on the level with Alabama right now, fine, bro. We don't care about Florida State and the rest of these clowns winning these one little, two little, three, the last championship. That's it. And Alabama ruled this college football for the last seven, eight years, Paul. We're going to continue to rule it. You hear me? So for this clown to get on here and say that, Paul, he's a lie. He wrote that article, Paul, in Invisible Ink. Roll Tide and have a good day. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, he hasn't gotten on yet, but we'll talk to him in a couple of minutes. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Casey Joyner, uh, college football insider for ESPN, already a terribly unpopular man on this program because he wrote an article entitled Why Alabama Won't Win the SCC. Uh, Casey, it's always uh, good to catch up. Uh, we're, we're all anxiously awaiting uh, your explanation here. Thanks for being on. Hey, great to be here. I'm just glad my grandma and grandpa aren't here to hear this because they're both Alabama fans and they would be just as upset. <laughs> well, I mean, listen, it's an opinion and it is uh, April, but uh, it, give us, uh, and you've laid it out quite uh, effectively on ESPN.com, but let's start with uh, your basic premise on why they won't win and uh, we'll, uh, hopefully the audience won't implode, but go, but go ahead and uh, give, us your, give, it, give it the best shot. Sure, and it, it, look, it starts on offense where, you know, it's one thing, everybody's got turnover and everybody's got talent in the SEC, but Alabama has maybe more turnover than anybody in this conference, and it's not even close. They're not going to have a very experienced quarterback. Whether if Coker wins it, he's got 100 career snaps, so he wouldn't have experience. Or if any of the other guys wins it, it's going to have nobody with any experience. They lost 217 out of 290 receptions at receiver, and their top candidate to take over for Amari Cooper, Cam Sims, he tore his ACL. They've got run game issues where, yeah, they've got some talent there, but they lost 54% of their rushing yards, uh, you know, from this past year. And the guys they have are either have question marks or, you know, they're unproven or on Kenyon Drake's place, you know, in case he's got an injury issue. One of the things that concerns me most in offense is losing three starters in the offensive line. And every guy who they've gotten looking to take this place, you know, take those places has either no experience or significant question marks. So you add that to a pass defense that ranked 10th in the SEC last year and in, in total QBR is losing both cornerbacks, has significant safety, or losing both safeties, has significant cornerback issues, and even the safeties who are supposed to be coming in to replace them, Geno Smith, he, you know, he's out with a second DUI, so that's, that's a big question mark there. You add that to some special teams issues that they have. They were by far the worst special teams in the SEC. It's just, you know, and the fourth toughest schedule. You start adding all those elements together, it's like, wow, I know that Alabama's got talent, but that's a big mountain to climb. Well, let's, let's talk about uh, what can be overcome, and obviously a schedule uh, is a schedule. There's not much you can do about that. But in the schedule, and clearly it ends, the season ends uh, with Auburn at Auburn. It begins with Wisconsin. Certainly, uh, you know, LSU is at home. 
uh, Mississippi State on the road, uh, but Ole Miss is at home. Arkansas is at home. I mean, it's, it's an interesting schedule. I mean, I've seen more difficult ones, but there is that Georgia game October 3rd. So, uh, what, I mean, I, know, I realize you, you, you are using metrics, but also the A&M game on the road, but what do you find most difficult about Alabama's schedule? Um, I think Tennessee is going to be, uh, uh, even though it's at home, I know it's at Brian Denny. If you look at Tennessee's roster and where they're sitting at right now, they're going to be the sleeper team of the SEC. I think that's going to be a tough game for them to win. I mean, if you're going back to back at Georgia, Arkansas, which, you know, they're an up and coming team at Texas A&M, and then you're playing a Tennessee club that, that is a sleeper team. And then two weeks after that, you're going against LSU at home, and then you've got to go at Mississippi State, and two weeks after that at Auburn. I wouldn't be surprised to see a couple losses in there. I mean, that, that, that you know, I, you know, if you go five and two against that, that slate of teams, you know, if you're playing well, you might go, you know, you, if you go seven and oh, that's incredible. But if you go six and one, you might expect that in a, in a normal year from Alabama with this many question marks. I wouldn't be surprised to see a five and two mark out of that. And if you're five and two in those, you know, you throw in one more loss, it wouldn't shock me to see Alabama lose three games this year. It's hard to put that together with, you know, where the other teams are and say, well, yeah, you're definitely going to, you know, win your division, much less win the conference. That's interesting because I will, I will tell you, someone asked me about Tennessee earlier, and, and I didn't think much of it, but in, when you look at it in context, that is a fairly difficult uh, schedule. Let me ask you about Wisconsin at the beginning and obviously Auburn at the end. Uh, you, you said you, you wouldn't be shocked to see them lose three games. Of the, of the schedule, uh, if you had to rank the most difficult game, would it be Georgia on the road? Yeah, I'd have to say it would be because it's on the road, either Georgia or Auburn, uh, but I'd probably say Georgia early on because Alabama's issues, you know, as they get later in the season, these young players are going to become you know, first-year veterans at least. They're going to have some experience under their belts, but it's the early games they are going to be the biggest question mark. I might even say that uh, if, it were, if it were a away game, it would be much tougher, but, I mean, you're playing Ole Miss at home, you know, you're only talking the you know, second game of the season This is going to, or third game of the season. This is going to be an inexperienced club facing – you know, a very good old Miss team. That's going to be a tougher game than maybe it's been in past years. So, but I would say of the of the of the uh, games on the schedule, yeah, I'd say probably uh, probably the uh, the Georgia game is the toughest because it's only five games in, and this is still going to be a very inexperienced team. Yeah, I realize you're you're uh, analyzing metrics. You're you're giving an opinion based on 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 what you see. You're just not throwing something up against the wall. You. You mentioned the three losses. I mean, realistically, if you looked at the schedule, you obviously have analyzed the team. Uh, give us the range, and maybe let's let's try to zero this zero in on where you think this this club will end up. Um, I really think they're probably going to lose to Georgia. I would say between the Texas A&M, LSU, Auburn, and Tennessee, you know, between those games we were just talking about, I'm surprised to see them lose one or two of those games. We're talking three losses. I think they could have three conference losses. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't think they're going to lose to Wisconsin necessarily. Uh, I think they could have three conference losses. If you look at three conference losses, you can just look at the other teams in the conference and say, are, are they going to lose three games or is Alabama with a tiebreaker against them? I think in that division, you are going to have at least one team that probably comes away with two losses. And I still think that, as I've mentioned before, that, that uh, you know, the, the SEC East is starting to come back on the rise. I think Tennessee's a very good club. Georgia may win that division, but I think Tennessee wouldn't surprise me if they won the division. And if by the end of the year, they might end up being a powerhouse club. So even if you come out of the West, it used to be that, okay, if you win the West, you're going to win you know, the whole SEC. I think this year that might get thrown into uh, a bit of uh, a quandary, too. KC, so if, if Alabama comes in between two and three losses in the SEC West, then uh, who would your most likely candidate be to win the division? Uh, that's that's uh, that's tough. I'm probably going to say that I, I would think it'd be uh, I would say LSU, um, but uh, I yeah, it, it, in the I think it's in the year between LSU and Auburn. If I had to, if I had to pick between those clubs, but I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be a year of transition. So. It wouldn't surprise me to see sleeper teams in both divisions. But you certainly, uh, obviously, not certainly or obviously, but you do not believe Alabama will win the uh, East based on your article. Excuse me, the West based on your article. I just don't think, you know, I think one of those clubs is going to come away with two wins. I just keep looking at them and I keep seeing three losses. And if you have three losses, I just don't think you can win that division. You, I think it's going to take, you know, you're going to have to only have two losses to win division. I think they're going to have three. It could be any of a number of candidates there who are going to do that. I happen to think, though, that, you know, like I said, whoever, I think that 
you might see either Georgia or Tennessee win the SEC this year just, you know, based on where they are. I think the SEC East is going to actually win the conference this year. So even if you win the Western Division, I don't think you're coming out with the chance. So I'm looking at Bama, you know, you just add all those issues that they have, you know, the major offensive issues, the defensive personnel turnover, and that special teams. I think that's going to come back to haunt them. I think it's going to be a game or two this year where I know they've got J.K. Scott, but there's going to be a game or two this year where they're special teams because they've got so many issues elsewhere. I don't think they're going to be able to improve that part of their team. I think that's going to cause them at least one loss. Casey, I realize my next question has nothing to do with your, your, what you've analyzed, but uh, considering that Alabama has ranked at the very top in recruiting uh, for the last six or seven years, I mean, they, they've been through a period that we've never seen before in modern college football. How do they end up in this position? It's the distribution of the talent. It's 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 well. The thing is, think about it this way: you've got a, a last year where they you know, devote forty percent of their passing offense to Amari Cooper. When you do that, and you're focusing all of your attention to one receiver, and you know, you, you 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 know, if you do that sort of offense, and mind you, hey, it worked. And Cooper is you know is what he is. He's one of the best talents in college football last year. He might be the first receiver taken in the draft this year. So, but when you do that. You're not developing your passing game with other receivers because they lost him. They lost the other two top wide receivers. And again, with Sins out, now you're talking, you know, the best guy you've got come back from last year was your fifth guy last year, and you've got some other talents too, but it's hard to overcome. You know, if you have talent and not, and I don't know if experience, because I happened to him last year, you know, in the, uh, in the old Miss game. That's, you know, they, they had a lot of talent, but they still hadn't developed that talent well enough to win that game. So you know, it's one of those things where you, you can't just have the talent. You've got to continue to develop the talent. Last year, I think they probably put it on all their eggs in too many, in too few baskets. Casey Joyner thinking Alabama could lose as many as three times this fall. His article, Why Alabama Won't Win the SEC. Casey, many thanks. Always good to visit. Hey, appreciate it. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Hey, Jason. Hey, what's up, Paul? Uh, every time I talk to you, something is I don't know, I lose the call. But uh, I want to ask you a couple things. Uh, do you ever get tired of hyping the SEC West? No, not really. Not uh, not lately because it's uh, – can you tell me the last time the SEC West didn't win the SEC championship? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this, the ridiculous myth that every friend I have that is a fan of the SEC West team, they they honestly think that every team in the SEC West can win the East. And the top two teams in the East last year went 4-0 and versus the West, and that comprised three teams. Arkansas, who beat LSU 17 to nothing, who beat Ole Miss. How, how, how was the score in that one? I mean, most People consider Arkansas to be a you know a good team last year, especially toward the end of the year when Georgia played them. But we put up such a lead on them in the second half, we allowed them to come back because Pruitt went into a basic. We're gonna make you take five minutes off the clock to score because we're not gonna let those those freakish tight ends you got get down the middle, you know, bust the seam and hit forty fifty yard gains. We let them dink and dunk. Yeah, they scored some points, but I mean, what was the halftime score? I mean, it just it just kills me that Georgia crushes Auburn. The next week, Auburn's offense, it, it looks unbelievable. 44 points on mighty Nick Saban's Alabama. And, I mean, it just it just blows my mind. But one last thing before you cut me off, whatever, I want to ask you. Uh, honest opinion. You, you ain't got to answer. You can say no comment. But uh, do you believe Logan Young was uh, murdered? I just I, I, I caught the uh, buddy of mine let me know about the uh, 10 stud, whatever. Roy yeah, uh, the, answer to that, the, answer, the answer to that is yes, I do. You do think he was murdered? Okay, mm -hmm. I was just wondering. I, I was, you know, because I know you, you, you probably know where all the bodies are buried at. So I was just curious. Well, I, don't, I mean, but I don't I know. Mean, I mean, I do know where he is buried. I don't, but I don't know. Uh, I mean, you know that was. I mean, I mean that, that's an opinion. That's not based on any fact. Right, that's right, just, right. Uh, I, know, I, I ain't trying to get you in trouble with the folks. Yeah. I mean, I was just wondering what your opinion was. There's nobody getting trouble I, with. He's dead. I understand, but I understand the West is. It, there's a lot of good programs. But this myth that all seven teams can win the East is just it, well. No, that's well, retarded. listen, Jason. I don't know. Uh, I know somebody said that. I, I, you haven't heard me say that. No, but I've heard it probably. 400 times since the start of last football season. Right I'm now, I, I would probably, I really, uh, I'm, I'm probably thinking there are three teams, that, three teams that can win the, the, the West, and I'll just leave those to your imagination. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Rick in L.A. Rick, thank you. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Feinbaum. Hello, fellas. Paul, first of all, as always, you're you're a dapper, 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 sharp, sharp outfit today. Thank you know, you. I got a suggestion. When this, okay. when you wrap up your show, you have credits rolling. We ought to know who 
the wardrobe is for Paul Feinbaum. <laughs> Put the name up there. Uh, that's anyway, a great idea. I have a question. And, I have a question and a comment, Paul. Number one. Um, now, does Lane Kiffin have carte blanche when it comes to calling the offense? I suspect he does. Okay. Now, I uh, enjoyed earlier my distant cousin Rick from California. And I'm a little surprised, too, being that he's out in California, and, but he broke down Alabama real good. But here is my take. Warning to Alabama fans about second year of Lane Kiffin. Number one, yes, Amari Cooper's gone, so you think you're going to spread out the ball. When he was at Southern Cal, he had a stable of wideouts. But he basically got his quarterback, young quarterback, focused once they got in one guy. One year it was Woods. The following year then was Marquise Lee. They got the bulk of it. The tight end disappeared. The other thing is running backs. I expect Henry to have a real breakout year, real big year. But he has an issue. He likes to run the ball, but as the game progresses, he loves putting that ball in the air. So this is just a little, little two things, Bama fans. Look out for this year how the offense. And again, the tight end. You know. Like last year, people are saying, well, I wish the tight end get more catches. It didn't happen. That happened when he was coaching out here. So just just to kind of a see what, what happens. About, you may have lost one receiver, but if he gets his young quarterback locked into one guy and he's doing a heck of a job, the others may get very few catches. Great, great analysis there, Rick. Thank you. Uh, always an uh, interesting uh, conversation. Eric is up next. Uh, good afternoon, Eric. Hey, Paul. Hi there. I wanted to comment on uh, that K.C. Joyner guy. He's a pretty smart guy, but he's not very knowledgeable about Alabama football. Uh, we don't rebuild. We reload. We got leaders on both sides of the ball. We got the greatest coaching staff, the greatest school, the greatest heritage. We mm -hmm. command respect. And I'll quote from Bear Bryant, winners make it happen, losers let it happen. Roll Tide. Not Barbara. Not Who is Barbara? <laughs> Daryl is next. I, 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 I just wanted to say, okay, this is actually Lane Kiffin, okay, and I just want y'all to know I am not worried. Of, I don't care about wins, okay? I, absolutely not at all. You, you, your, your head coach, Nick Saban, I, I, all I care about is stats. This is a temporary state for me, okay? I, I'm, I am looking to become a head coach. And to do that, I need big time staff. I, I, y'all don't expect me to stay here. Do y'all, y'all think I'm gonna stay here working on Nick Saban forever? It ain't happening. And put up with you with this ridiculous fan base? It is not happening. It ain't happening. I gotta ask you something, okay? I'm with you yesterday. I'm with you somewhat. I understand about you said you can't hold Florida accountable for Hernandez. But let me ask you this: in your in your in your opinion, do you think that he thought he was gonna get off? I mean, this week? He found not guilty. No, no, I didn't think. Uh, I don't know anyone who thought Hernandez was going to get off. I was shocked. No, took, I mean took, Hernandez himself. Well, there's no way I could get inside uh, that animal's head. I, I'm saying just the, the look on his face, the mannerisms, the arrogance, I really believe that he thought he was going to be. I'm going to say he was going to be found not guilty. I really believe. And you know why he, you know why he thought that way, Paul? Because everybody's always gotten him out of it, everything he's gotten into. That's why I said Florida's got to be held somewhat responsible. Because if they would have held a knife to his throat and made him pay for, for the things he'd done in his past, we probably wouldn't have never got to it. We might have might have, who knows. But, 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 you know, you let somebody keep getting away with stuff. And they just well, I'm going to say this for the final time, though. And you may be right. I can't, I can't quibble with some of that. But ultimately, Bob Kraft is responsible. Bill Belichick is responsible. They're, they're the ones who enabled him last. They gave him the big deal. They propped him up. Uh, he was bulletproof, and uh, we all know what he did. Well, that's true. But you know what, Paul? I know that he had to write a letter to all the NFL teams saying that he would take a, a drug test every two weeks. He begged New England, please draft me, please draft me. I believe if Florida would have been up front, with, with them about him, they would never, they would never, they would never. But, but, but never Darryl, how many, uh, how many college programs are up front about anything when it comes well, I know. to? I, well, you're right. I understand that. I understand. Hey, I mean, you, I mean, I you heard Saban three weeks ago, two weeks ago. Uh, I mean, he was still ignoring the fact of, of what he had on his own roster. Uh, who would, you know, uh, you know the story. Yeah, exactly. Here's the deal with the Bama fans, okay? 
if there's one thing the Alabama fans love to do more than anything else, the one thing they love to do is brag, brother. They love brag. And they didn't have a lot of brag about lately. I mean, the basketball coach got fired, okay? They didn't make the March Madness. They tried to brag on their head coach by, by bringing in Taylor, and that blew up on the thing. But they didn't have a whole lot to brag about lately. So, so, so now football season goes around, and they want, that's why they're bragging so much about the, the West and all that. I mean, well, we've seen what the West has got in Alabama the last few years. I mean, they got them a one and done in the playoff. They got them blowed out against Oklahoma. And how is how is a quarterback who who was couldn't be beat out the backup for AJ McCarry? Couldn't beat out AJ McCarry's backup. And so go out there this year, okay? Go throw to a receiving core that lost eighty percent of their of the receiving yards. When's the last time Alabama had a really good wide receiver over the last couple of years outside? Of Lamar Cooper. I mean, I can't think. I can't think about Alabama uh, wide receiver. The running game, and they lost. Uh, what's his face? He lost and failed on him. But in, in a real hey, hey, I mean, Daryl, you're, you're screaming so loud, we can barely make out anything you're saying. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Bobby is up next uh, in Birmingham. Hey, Bobby. Hey, how you doing today, buddy? Pretty well. Hey, about Coach Kippen. You know what I'm saying? What, what Coach Kippen going to do and what Coach Kippen not going to do? Well, I want to say this, and I'm going to leave it alone. Nick Saban is the head coach. And they say, well, Alabama ain't got a quarterback. They got five, Paul. They got Coco, Bateman, Mark. Hey, let me, hey, hey, Bobby, you've been around a long time. Yeah. What's the, what's the oldest cliche in, in football when it comes to a quarterback? If you, if you have more than one, you have none. That's well, the cliche. Well, well let, me, let me finish, Paul. We'll be all right. If we just don't let Joey Galloway and ESPN name the starter, we'll be up. We'll be all right as far as the quarterbacks are concerned. But that, that fella, uh, John, where you get that fella from? I like him. He can see the future, boy. He, he, he's a prophet. You know, I thought all the prophets were gone. But where did he go to college yet, Paul? Uh, the, the John that was just on? Yeah, John. I'm talking about John, or KC. Oh, well, KC Jordan. I have no earthly idea where KC went to college. Yeah, well, wherever he went, I bet he majored in statistics and mining and smartphones and computers. Well, I mean, but, are, are you telling me, Bobby, listen, you're a smart guy, that you, you didn't agree with some of what he said? Well, I might agree with some of, some of what he said, Paul, but there's one thing I didn't agree with what he said. And I'm going to say this, Paul, and I'm going let, to let you go so some other uh, Alabama fans can call in. We might lose a game, but it won't be to Georgia because we got a secret weapon when it comes to Georgia. And the Georgia fans know that, too, but they won't admit it. We got Mark Rick. And he came with Well, yeah, uh, come on, let's not get carried away. Bobby, by the way, I, I thought you were, to, I thought you were going to answer uh, when, uh, who was it, uh, Daryl talked about, or someone said, the last time Alabama's gone forever without having a wide receiver before Amari Cooper. I guess people have forgotten about Julio Jones. Oh, yeah, yeah, Julio Jones, but, but Paul, we, we put our, our eggs in the running. Well, I'll tell you this, Bobby, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to educate you. You're, you're a smart man, but you, know, you keep talking smack about someone, and eventually it will boomerang. I heard a lot of smack about right. Urban Meyer, and a lot of people made fun of Nick Saban owning Urban Meyer, and who got owned on January 1st. Oh, well, you keep talking the same way about Mark Rick, wait, and you'll find wait, yourself wait. on the other side of that. Mark Rick's a very good football coach, I can oh, assure right. you that. Right, but he can't win the big one. Well, I don't know about that. Um, well, we'll see. We'll he see. Uh, he, uh, he, he scared Nick Saban to death about three years ago in the Georgia Dome. Well, Paul, we talking out the ball. That yesterday's cold ain't going to win the day's ball game, Paul. We got to play today. Okay, you tell me, uh, when, I mean, Nick Saban's record, uh, I mean, he, I mean, he, he's, he's, he's certainly had a, had, uh, Les Miles' number since 2011 in the uh, championship game. But other than that, uh, he's had, he's taken some knocks. He lost to well, Kevin Sumlin. He's lost to, uh, Gus Malzahn. Uh, he, he's not perfect. Right, but we could have won that game against Well, Kevin you could have won every game, but uh, right. you, you, lo you right. lost the biggest game right. of the year last year in college football for for, for the SEC. Nick Saban right. lost but, to Urban Meyer. And don't tell me Alabama should have won well, that well, game, too. 
Yeah, we should have won, and you know we should have won. Oh, yeah, too. sure. You Alabama, won. Should, oh, okay. Alabama should never lose. I mean, That's according right. to you, Bobby, Alabama yeah. has never lost a we, game. Well, I mean, well, what, what, well, what's that? Well, well, what about Nick Saban against Auburn? What about that brilliant special teams coaching by Nick Saban two and a half years ago that cost him another national championship? That was just a lucky play. That boy happened to be back there. That play oh, wasn't okay. Paul. No. Call a spade a spade, Paul. We'll call it whatever you want to call it, Bobby. Right. You know that. And you're an Alabama fan, too. You know oh, that. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Roll <laughs> right. Tide. Right. Bye, Paul. <laughs> Larry is up next. Where's Larry been? Oh, man. Waiting on this basketball crap to get over. It's over. Oh, thank God. And now that the games begin, brother, I'm ready. You know what? And I've been listening and listening and biting, just crunching my, gripping my teeth. Daryl, worry about Georgia. Wow, you're right, Paul. He screamed, so you just can't understand it. You know, Obama's going to roll, and this guy comes in with all these stats. He can tell you Obama ain't going to win it, but he damn can't tell you who is. Now, how smart is he? You there? Barely. Well, tell me, he, he, he showed that bar smart. With yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean that, that's a very good point, Larry, all kidding aside. You know, yeah. I can, the two of us can get statistics together, and this guy has ESPN stats uh, in his back pocket, and you can make a case why Alabama shouldn't win. The only thing I'm surprised by is why Alabama fans have reacted the way they have. What do they care about some guy at ESPN.com? Yeah, and, yeah, and you know, yeah, they have Nick Saban, board. don't they? How many times have we heard yeah. that tonight? That's right. And Clay Travis upset me more and he heard my dog barking. When I talked to him, he even pissed my dog off. I mean, when I talked to that guy. But this guy, look, we were in trouble last year. I didn't think we were going to do as good as we did. No, this of year, not, Larry. I feel better. What and what makes you feel better, Larry? Well, Tony Brown, Marlon Humphrey aren't freshmen. Mm, Josh is back. He's he's injury free. Oh yeah, he's, he's great. Hey man, he's good. He falls down at once in a while. He falls but down a lot. <laughs> and who's your quarterback going to be? Uh, you gonna you can see if Jameis has an extra year of eligibility. Come on, man. You know, listen. One quarterback is great, and like you said, more than one, you don't have none. It, it's just this issue here is going to hurt us. I can think of six quarterbacks that could play for Alabama next year, Larry, but I haven't heard of one that I'm impressed with yet. Maybe I will in a couple of days, but not yet. You can do it, Bob. No, I can't can play quarterback at Alabama. Brother, you can do anything, Jack. No way I'm taking orders from Lane Kiffin, I promise you. That's not happening. <laughs> you don't like the Lane? I like Lane. I'm just, I just didn't, I'm just not, he's not telling me what to do. There you go, fine ball. Hey, thanks for the call, Larry. Right, man. Good, good to hear from you, buddy. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Larry is up next. Hey, Larry. Hey, Mr. Feinbaum. How you get along with Okay. Hey, great, great. Hey, at first I wanted to tell old Daryl how much I appreciate him and his uh, fellow coal miners. That is a uh, tough and dirty job. I appreciate all they do right there. Hey, uh, on this show today, man, I'm like a kid in the candy store. I mean, uh... O.K.C. Jordan, now he's dealing that little truth serum down there, and I mean, I know it's uh, bad medicine goes down kind of hard. I mean, I had to laugh, old Jerome. He was disputing what he said before he even heard what he said. I mean, that, which was in typical Bama fashion. I mean, I never thought I'd see the day that that's a tied caller calling and say, well, you know, we'll probably lose two games, but that, you know, we still love them. Uh, two games is pretty good. I mean, uh, this is a pretty sad uh, testimony, really. I mean, uh, two games is too, too many. Uh, and you better run the table on that. Uh, the last thing, uh, not the last thing I'll say, but it's, it's, to me it's obvious, Shorty, uh, in one more year he's be in the SEC, all right, but there won't be no SEC football. It'll be SEC Network. that would be where he'll be. Uh, he's got one more year, and then he's done. You think we should save him, save him a cubicle here? Yeah, I mean, he, he's toast. You can see that. I mean, uh and I'll tell you why. The last thing I'll say, the last two bowl games, you've given up 45 points and 42. 
uh, which equals 87. That ain't real good. Uh, and I guarantee you, every time he looks in the mirror, he sees another Alabama legend. Joe Namath in a Rams uniform. It's over. Thanks, Paul. I'm sure. <laughs> Let's continue with more calls. And uh, Jamie in Baton Rouge. How are you, Jamie? Pretty good. How are you? Great. Hey, earlier you quoted Mark Rick being a great coach. When was the last time he even won anything? LSU stumped a mud hole 42 to 10 just a few years ago on Georgia. Yeah, I remember the game. So tell me, when was the last time he even won anything? When was the last time? Besides uh, regular, little regular one. Regular season. Oh, well, listen, game. Mark, Rick, Mark Rick's record speaks for itself. Uh, I, I think he's an outstanding coach. That's my opinion. You obviously have a differing opinion. You're, you're an LSU fan, right? Of course. When was the last time LSU won something? Uh, they went undefeated just three years ago, and they've been pretty much beaten. Highly three ranked three years ago, they went undefeated in the 2011 season. And then uh, that's the year they beat Georgia. Georgia was in the SEC championship game the following year. And nearly beat Alabama. They didn't, but they they nearly did. So, uh, what has LSU done since January of 2013 when they lost to Alabama? They I mean they got blown out by Alabama in the Superdome. Well, you'll see what they're going to do this upcoming no, year. I mean, what, what, what you talk about? You want me to give you Mark Rick's big wins? When uh, what, what's LSU's big win in the 13, 14, uh, in, in the 12, 13, and 14 season? Do you have one? Well, we had no quarterback this past year, so... I'm talking about the last three years. Uh, no comment. Oh, Just okay. wait until the season. Though, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wait till the season. Good, thanks for the heads up. <laughs> K-Dub is next. You slapping in the morale, baby. I love you, baby. I hey, you know, I, I, K-Dub, I had to leave the game early uh, in the Superdome <laughs> to catch a plane, which you were on, by the way. Uh, has LSU scored yet? No, they had scoring in that game. Yeah, we definitely was on that plane, and you definitely seen my face. I was happy that day. But yeah, I mean, you just slapping the air. You didn't have to do my boy Bobby like that early. You just <laughs> slapping them around. You slapping this guy around. I like around. Bobby. I mean, Bob, Bobby to me is uh, one of my favorite people. But uh, I just, I was just trying to bring Bobby back to reality. That's all. I understand, baby. I understand. But you, I mean, I, I don't even know if I even want to go in. I mean, you hot right now, baby. I mean, somebody need to get the, some ice water for my boy. But I want to say this about the, the, the guy that was talking about Alabama. Look, everybody talking about the whole quarterback situation. And I had, I, I had you agree with me this, this time last year on this situation. Hey, by the way, I, I, I forgot, uh, I apologize, uh, but you know, he, the, the LSU fan was talking smack about Mark Rick. I, I did remember one of Mark Rick's last big wins, and it was in uh, 2013 in September when uh, I was there for college game day when, when guess who, when, when Georgia beat LSU. Remember the famous Zach Mettenberger game, his return home? I believe so, didn't he? Yeah. I believe so. I believe so. I believe so. But you know, I, I you know, I'm not gonna talk that kind of smack, you know. But I, I did want to say this, and you was right. It's one thing, especially when Darren went when the last time Alabama had a good receiver. My first thing I'm thinking is, ding, 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 Julio Jones blew up for like three touchdowns yeah. in the first in the first half of that game in Georgia. So out of all people, you should remember Julio Jones. Well, so but I, whole, was, I was thinking. I mean, that was 2008. I was trying to come up with. Uh, Someone more modern, but uh, Julio was pretty good. One of the best wide receivers in Alabama history. But they said it would never be another Julio near Amari Collins. But, I mean, it's always going to be someone else. And my whole thing on this quarterback situation, everybody talking about this first year unproven. Greg McElroy won the SEC championship, national championship his first year. A.J. McCarron won a national championship his first year. Blake Sims won the SEC championship his first year as a star quarterback. Heck, even J.P. Wilson, he won the first year starter, but, I mean, he went all that great. He even took us to an SEC championship when Nick got there. So my thing is, it's not that hard, people. It's not that hard. Appreciate it, Bees. Thank you very much, K-Dub. Always good to visit with you. And uh, Jumbo is up next in Tuscaloosa. Hey, Jumbo. Paul, Paul, how you doing, man? I'm kind of scared okay. to talk to you today. You, you are on fire, son. Whew. It's hey, um, I want to say something to this guy, Matt, in uh, Tennessee. This guy, okay. look, man, we're not going to shut up. 
we're Alabama. He said, us, he, he said he would need to shut up, but us shutting up is like him going up and slapping the president. It ain't going to happen. And the tall, or, um, I, the, the guy over in Georgia, I can't think of his name now. I, I made a bet with him. Da, uh, Darren, is that his name? Darren. Darren. Uh, my offer's still on the table. You're talking crap about Alabama, I still got it on the table. You want to take it, man up and take it. So, and as far as our quarterback situation goes, we talked about this last year, Paul. You, you said it, I said it. We didn't believe we had a quarterback. We're Alabama. We're going to be just fine. Nothing's going to stop us from winning the SEC this year. We're going to do it. And this, this guy from ESPN, I don't give a rat's tail about what he's saying. Let him keep talking trash. If he's making money talking trash. Let him keep doing it. We're Alabama. We're going to win this thing. Everybody will be eating their words. Roll time. There you have it. The Alabama Nation has responded to Casey Joyner. This is the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. We're joined uh, by Maria Taylor, uh, the host of SEC Now, and pretty much uh, the traveling correspondent. You uh, were in South Carolina for Pro Day. You're heading to Auburn. You were in Georgia. Let's uh, let's start with uh, South Carolina. The the uh, the head ball coach was here the other day. Some confusing comments about how long you're staying, about last year. You know him. You've been there two straight years for the spring game. So uh, what's your read on the on the Gamecocks? I think that, uh, first of all, as long as Coach Spurrier is having fun, he's still going to be around. And from what I can tell, at least from being there in pro day, he was still enjoying himself. I mean, he was walking around the weight room, dapping everybody up. Do you know what a dap is? I uh, assume. Okay, it's like a pound. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, you know, we'll work on it. I don't it. live in the same world that you do. You don't. It's a process. I'm going to bring you in. It's fine. But he seems to be really enjoying himself. And now you got Marcus Lattimore back, you know, his ambassador to the team. And it was good to see him kind of interacting. Was, was Marcus dapping people up too? He was also dapping. This is it. Come on. No. Oh. Okay. There you go. One, two. So you got it up, yep. up, down. Pound. Up, down, pound. Wow. You just dap me up. And by the way, my new uh, my new CD will be out next Tuesday. <laughs> Your LPs dropping. Dapping down. <laughs> up, down, pound. <laughs> What were we even talking about? Who knows? Who cares? Whatever. We'll I'm dapped. I, by the way, I'm officially dapped out. You're done, show. huh? So, um, uh, so what, what? You're talking about the HBC. HBC. And then, oh, talking to Marcus Lattimore, who's kind of been placed there. I feel like he's going to end up being a mentor. He's going to be around the program and helping out a lot. And it seems as though the feeling is there's nowhere to go but up. After talking to him, I mean, all of the players are kind of excited to get back on the field and erase the memory of everything that happened last year. So that start over mentality was what was the theme of the spring. So I, I left feeling pretty good about it. But I got to say, after having the first game last year, I felt like this was a team that was going to have a great season. Yeah. So You know what I mean? So I left with the same feeling, but not as high hopes because of what I saw on the field last year. Georgia, what was your takeaway from uh, the dogs? My takeaway was that Jacob Park is the most talented quarterback that is on the field for Georgia. Okay. But he might not be the starter. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I feel like that's the story, right? Quarterback situation. And But when I – so I walk on to campus at Georgia. I'm at the weight room. Jacob Park rolls up. He's got a skateboard in his hand. I think he had on, like, an Arizona sweatshirt or something. He's sure. just got, like, this swag. They don't have, they don't have Georgia stuff at the uh, bookstore. Oh, no. He was wearing and – I, and I thought to myself, I was like, maybe he just filled out his bracket and he wants Arizona to win, so he's trying to rep all day long. That's what I thought. But he said he just kind of, like, likes Arizona, so he had it on. And the first thing that he said was, you know, hey, I'm, like, really enjoying my time here at Georgia. But what I got from him was he had a lot of swag. Like, he, he would draw you in. I wanted to know more about him when I left. I can't say that about every player that I run into. And that's yeah, what's it like? Because, I mean, you, you went to, I mean, in this case, you went to Georgia. Some of those guys probably know that. But they, they know who you are. They see you on TV. Um, By the way, I went throughout the entire weight room and banged on the doors because all the staff came from Alabama. I was like, hey, my name's Maria. I went to Georgia. And I want you to know that. Wow. <laughs> is that, is because it, I feel like that helps, you know? Yeah. Like, you, I just want everyone to know that well, it's I mean, okay. I mean, talk a little about that because, I mean, you, you're, you're known, but you still have to do the work. When you walk in, you can't just, hey, look at me. Right. I'm, I'm on TV. So I, I, what is your approach in trying to bring people in? Yeah, trying to build relationships. See, when I walk in the place, I just... When you walk in the place, everyone was like, there goes Fishburn. Here he is. Yeah. What's up? That's what they do. 
That's what the South Carolina women's team said about you. Called me Fishburne? They called you Fishburne. That's okay. <laughs> no big deal. I was nice to them. <laughs> you were. You had Dawn on. So right. No big deal. Uh, would... I don't start up with women's <laughs> basketball programs that are in the Final Four. Yeah, please don't. No. Please don't. Uh, I feel like the first thing you have to do is just walk up to someone and be nice because they might think that you're standing. I don't ever want anyone to think that I have a cold shoulder or just because I'm there, I'm going to get the information. Sure. Or I'm there to do my job and I don't have to talk to anyone. So the first thing I do is, like I said, I went and knocked on doors and just said, hey, and just strike up conversations with whoever I can. You know what I mean? So I, I have to ask you this. I know I'm getting off subject, but mm -hmm. uh, it's been about a month, but you were on uh, His and Her. Yeah. What was it? You were cool. I was... <laughs> you liked it? Oh, yeah, I watched. Wh which one did you watch? I watched the first one, I think. Uh -huh. um, the second one we had a lot of fun with LeBron's selfie game. Okay. Yeah, he was posting, like, sad you selfies. You looked very like comfortable. That's, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, sitting here with you, mm -hmm. this is everything. Right. My yes. job is people. People. I mean, I'm, I'm unconventional, but mm -hmm. my job is always. You're unconventional. Well, I mean, I'm not one of these typical because I'm not a television person. Right. I come from a different world, but my 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 goal is always to make you forget you're on television. Right. I could see that. And sometimes I forget. <laughs> Do you? I just quit. Why? Like, like I'm just like, down. <laughs> and then we're. I mean, obviously, we're also being heard on radio, but you. you it's. It's. You have to make. And I know you do that as a, as a sideline interviewer. It's different. You're in the moment. But mm -hmm. what we're talking about, you going, you dapping people uh, yeah. in the weight room. You want them to Stay feel dapping comfortable. Dapping people up. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, that's I'm write job. that down and dapping study it tonight. Up. Maybe tweet that out. Like, maybe we'll dap each other up and we'll tweet a picture out. Coming soon. Wait for it. Okay. Um, yeah, but, no, that's my job. You're, my job as a reporter is to make people feel comfortable and feel like they can trust me and you have to be trustworthy. So you prove it every day that you're kind of out there and making sure that everything that you're saying is newsworthy and correct and accurate. So that's my job as well. Um, but I think I think people feel comfortable talking to me. So you're, you're mentioning where you've been. Auburn this weekend, there's a spring game, there's softball. There's a lot going on down there. A lot going on. And me and Matt Stinchcomb, we were just there um, because we did the spring practice reports and everything. So we sat down with... Jeremy Johnson and Carl Lawson. Wait, wait, what's your take on Jeremy Johnson? Because there's so much hype about him. Mm -hmm. I think he's awesome. What is extraordinary about him is every game that I've done over the seasons at Auburn, especially last year, when he's coming in, he's knowing he's good enough to start probably at any other SEC school right. in that moment. And he is never, like, hanging his head. He never looks like he's thinking about what he's about to do after the game. He is, like, intently watching. He's the first person that Nick Marshall runs to when he's going off of the field. You had him for the game that he started. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. And, and he, it was no sweat off his back. And he threw for 240 yards or whatever, you know, starting a game in the middle of the season or in the beginning of the season. That was the Arkansas game. Yeah. Before so, we knew that Arkansas was. <laughs> what they are. <laughs> well, we didn't know Arkansas was Arkansas. Right. So we, all we knew was they were an SEC team. Yeah. That's I remember being down there that morning going, this, this is kind of an okay game, but not really very Hey, exciting. they hung in there longer they than did. we thought. And then the rain happened. It was like a. And by the way, when that happens, I mean, you're, I mean, you're all you're all made up. Yeah. You're trying to. So I go with wet and wavy hair, yeah. so that when it rains, my hair will just curl up. Okay. Do you do the same? I I, I don't ever no. go outside when it rains. <laughs> I have I have people that do you, that for you me. You know what? You're so special that you guys are always covered. Yeah. Well, you it, and Tess and TiVo and Spears, you're just. Well, I will tell you a funny story on that. We weather. Uh, I mean, we we got we we definitely get wet, but I, I did uh, on game day the previous year two different two straight weeks. I mean. You know, I was a, a novice, and it was so cool to be on the set with all those guys. So uh, the first week we're in uh, Seattle, and it's raining. They tell me, you, you and Pollock just go out there. Herbie, and they're not getting out in the rain. <laughs> Second week we were somewhere else, same thing. I'm like, oh, hey, this is my well, life. Did you get an umbrella with someone kind of like standing um, in the they, At one point, uh, the first time we did it, we didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. The second time they were able to kind of hold something over us. You know, the best thing that happened to me one time, I was filling in for Sam Ponder on the Thursday game, mm -hmm. and they had, like, an entire tent built for her, like a home, a staging unit. And I was like, oh, That's so how she moved this, is, this is what it's – you no, get, to, it's, it's you get to hide, you get a home and a tent. And I went back to my crew, and I was like, hey, listen, when we have inclement weather, we're going to have to get some trash bags or something. No, Just build uh, it out. Just build it out. <laughs> and, and by the way, we're not exactly slumming it here. <laughs> we're not. <laughs> I mean, this, you know, our digs aren't that bad. No, they're not bad. <laughs> Well, uh, I know you have SEC now tonight. We uh, obviously talked about, uh, does the travel ever stop? Or I guess it's pretty much until the end of the uh, I think the next thing I have coming, I'm doing a new Tennessee's uh, spring, game. spring game as well. Butch Jones. He's one of my faves. Oh, he's cool. Isn't he? Oh, yeah. 
I mean, first of all, he'll let you come in and do anything that you want to do as far as, like, letting cameras in, walking into the office, or having access to players. But I mean, you have a uh, – I don't want to say this too loudly, but there are some coaches that you go, oh, I can't believe I got to go do that guy. I mean, don't you feel that way? Uh, but I don't have to deal with them mm-hmm. like you do. I mean, we uh, – on our show, I mean, most of them come by uh, either on Friday and then ultimately on Saturday, and, and it's short, but right. you're not having to – it's quick. I mean, some coaches are, let's be honest, painful. I know. Here's what I say. I think that sideline reporters are in the trenches. Yeah. You are a skill position player. So right. you get all the glory and you get to sit up here and talk about everything. Yeah. Like after the dust is settled, you know, you break free and you get a touchdown every single time. It's not guaranteed no. that anything is going to happen to me, but I mean, I'm going to try to set you up to see. That's why you have upward mobility in your career and mine's pretty much over. <laughs> no. <laughs> you're the all-star, man. You're the guy. You're the 15-year vet. Yeah. You can totally ride it out. Yeah. You're going to be like Champ Bailey. Boy, I saw him in here the other day. So that's cool. what I, I was up. really impressed with him. Yeah, me too. I could spend some time with him, too. I just started thinking of the amount of money that he's made in his career. It's got to be ridiculous. Oh. oh, it's probably close to yours, or <laughs> maybe you're coming in like I don't right I, underneath I, him? I, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm happy. I'm, my, my career's had a decent run. Yeah. yeah. You've got some pretty – I'm liking this sweater tie that you have on right now. I feel like every single day – your style. This is it. I work Incrementally hard. better. I, mean, it's, that's a, I don't prepare for the show. I sit in my closet for four <laughs> hours going, that tie or that tie. <laughs> and you chose the right one I, today. I like this one. It's, it's, the good part about this tie, that it it's, looks like uh, a sock. you can use it to clean your glasses, wipe the counter, I and mean, it's knit. So. It, do, it does look like a sock. Tie. I mean, throw it away. No, but literally, it looks like those sock. sock monkeys. It does. It, right? It, it, but, you know, these are... These are, the, these are the rage this spring. They won't be worth a flip like in uh, on June 15th. But Not at all. That's I bought okay. all six of them at the dollar store yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Maria Taylor, we'll see you later on. Thanks for the time. Thank you for listening to the best of the Paul Feinbaum podcast. Tune into the Paul Feinbaum show every day from 3 to 7 Eastern on the SEC Network or on the ESPN radio app. Geico presents Strange Savings Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Major League Baseball on ESPN Radio. Last season, the Pirates reached the postseason for the second consecutive season, only to be sent home early after losing the wild card. Will they return for the third straight year? This weekend, they face the Cubs, who have plans to make their first postseason berth since 2008. The Cubs and Pirates, the pregame at 3 Eastern, first pitch at 4. Saturday on ESPN Radio and the new ESPN app. Two of baseball's best go head-to-head in interleague action when the Tigers head to St. Louis to face the Cardinals. The pregame at 7 Eastern, first pitch at 8, Sunday on ESPN and ESPN Radio.